Today's video is going to be on environmentally friendly pottery. It's um, based on an infographic that I posted to Instagram a couple of weeks ago um, and I will post the link to that below. This is going to be a, a longer form, uh, more waffly version of it. If you want the short text version, check out the link rather than watching this. I'm going to be throwing large swelly mugs while I do it. Um, and yeah, hopefully this all makes sense and is easy to follow. But basically, what I was doing was looking at the three R's, or now seven R's, which the original three were reduce, reuse, recycle, and now they've been extended, and I've seen it written a dozen different ways. So hopefully I get this right for how I put it on the text, which I believe it was rethink, refuse, reduce recycle no reduce reuse regift repair recycle so the idea behind the original three is that um when you're thinking about purchasing or what to do with things um a good way to reduce your environmental footprint is to to think of them in those terms um can you go without it can you reduce your consumption if you can't reduce your consumption can you at least reuse the thing so you use it once as one thing and then rather than throwing it away you use it as another and then if you can't reduce it and you can't reuse it can you at least recycle it um, and that was the original three and then they've added to that the kind of rethinking so what type of consumer do you want to be refusing just not buying something if it doesn't align with the type of consumer you want to be um, reduce reuse and then repair and re-gift so can it be fixed or can you give it to someone else if it's still usable but you're not going to use it and then recycle and they're in order of importance because um, if you can avoid buying something that's better than just recycling it once you're done with it um, yeah, so those are a way of looking at your decisions um, with the environment in mind and they're quite a good framework for looking at the decisions that we make with regards to pottery um, and it's probably the easiest way to do it the way I did it for uh, the infographic is to break it down by material or process so the, I think I started with water um, and this was sparked in part by um, the water shortages that California are having and there's quite a few potters posting tips on how to reduce their water which is something I've been thinking about for my studio but with less urgency because things aren't so bad over here it's more just you don't actually need that much water if you're thoughtful about it um, it's the cost of water is somewhat hidden in that it's incredibly cheap for what it is um, because it's a public utility you know a lot of work goes into preparing drinking water um, and we can have a fresh supply, or most of us can have a fresh supply through our taps um, and to make sure that everyone has access to it, it's not prohibitively expensive but what that means is there's actually no incentive for looking after the water you have particularly um, and so to start with I would just wash things in the tap I'd, you know, I wouldn't run the tap when I wasn't using it but I also would run the tap over things because it makes cleaning clay off more straightforward, easy, fast, etc. etc. But you don't need to. Um, so, in terms of reducing water, what a lot of the Californian potters and anyone who's um, in a water deprived area, uh, what they're doing is using a two bucket system. You fill up a bucket of water um, and then all your clay things get rinsed in that first so that bucket will get very dirty very quickly but the advantage 
uh, clay over a lot of other things is it settles to the bottom. So what you can do is you can use that bucket as the initial clean bucket, then you can have a second cleaner bucket and you can rinse uh, the tools off in that one to get them properly clean. And then you can just decant, you set either one of the buckets aside um, and let it settle for a little while and you can get the water from the top and clay from the bottom and then you can reclaim the clay and the water's still usable water on top. So in terms of reducing water or reusing water, you can reduce water by not running a tap. Very easy thing to do if you're, if you're in an area where you don't need to be that careful about water, just don't run the tap unnecessarily. So kind of scrub the worst of the clay off first and then use the water to rinse it. If you want to reuse the water you can just obviously keep using it over and over again by keeping it in buckets don't dispose of it before um, you need to and then you can recycle water by ultimately once you've like if it started to go green or something like that you can use it to water plants so yeah the the main thing is having a series of buckets that you don't throw away the water of and you let the stuff settle to the bottom um, I would recommend having a different one for clay and for glaze because then you can reclaim the clay as clay and you get a kind of mystery glaze from all the uh, leftovers of the glaze that you put in there if you mix the two together you'll save water but you won't be able to reclaim those so having two buckets and then um, you know, processing it afterwards is the best way to deal with that. So then following on from that, um, reducing clay use is, there's a few different ways you can do that. Obviously recycling, reusing your clay will reduce it, but um, being much faster to discard a piece will reduce your clay use. So if there's a piece that you don't think is going to be viable at the end of the process, just chuck it straight in the reclaim. Don't bisque it, because once you've bisked it, you can't reclaim it. So before bisking any piece, be very quick to reject it. If you think it's not going to survive, then there's no point in firing it. You waste the clay, it wastes the energy. So that's a good way to easily reduce the amount of clay you're using. Um, also, and this is obviously easier said than done, but throwing pieces thinner um, reduces the clay you're using. So if you can get better at throwing, not throw incredibly thick pieces, then that reduces the clay. Um, but obviously that's a, most people would want to do that regardless. So it's not like people are, and not getting better because they don't care about clay. Uh, you know, that's not that's not the, the, the issue behind that one. Um, reusing clay, obviously you can reclaim it, you can throw something, don't like it, reclaim it, use it again. Uh, clay is more or less infinitely recyclable so long as you're reclaiming the whole of the clay um, because the throwing slip you end up with on your hands will most likely contain a slightly different mix of particles to uh, the clay that's left behind so you get the finer particles on your hands and that's where if you've got a groggy clay and you overwork it you'll end up with it will feel very coarse you'll have the silt on your hands and the, the grog will stay behind that means that if you throw away your throwing water and you keep recycling your thrown clay eventually it'll have a different mix of particle sizes than it started with. Um, probably not the end of the world, but with some clays that will matter more than others. So something to be aware of. Um, but if you're keeping all of your throwing water and reclaiming everything to do with the clay, you'll get back essentially the same clay body that you started with and you can keep throwing it over and over. Um, and then recycling 
I was looking at this in terms of once you've fired it, what can you do with it? Um, so you fire a piece, you don't like it, what can you do with it? If it's been fired to grog, oh sorry, if it's been fired to bisque, some people turn it into grog. I'm a little sceptical of you know, how big a thing that is, because I don't know how much, how many of you are adding grog to your clay at all, and then those of you that are, how much grog you're actually adding. Because if it's a couple of percent, um, and it's quite a lot of effort to turn unwanted bisqueware into grog, you have to crush it, ball mill it, sieve it, etc, etc. So, not so sure about that one, but if it's glazed, there's quite a few mosaic artists or people who can use it in their process. Or what I've done with a lot of mine is um, people building bases for sheds. Uh, they want hardcore, so just kind of rubble to put into things for which um, recycled, smashed up uh, pots are fine. So it uses, it means that people can build concrete bases and things like that using less new material, um, less cement, so that's better for the environment and it gives them a new home. So, I mean, you, with all these sorts of things, you've got to find someone else that wants it, but if you can, there are people that will. Um, it's just a case of getting in touch with them. Uh, and I don't really have any great tips for that. That only came about because my dad happened to know someone who wanted it. Uh, I don't know how you would find someone who was looking to build a shed, but um, then moving on from that, you've got the glaze. Um, reducing can be things like applying glaze sensibly, so not applying glaze, a full glaze to a piece that you don't think is going to survive. It can be testing sensibly, so I've done uh, quite a few um, videos on my more efficient ways of testing glazes just because I don't like mixing up big batches so the most I'll generally mix up when testing a glaze is a hundred grams of a base glaze and then I'll try and add colorants to smaller amounts or I will do line blends so I can mix up a hundred grams but then I can get 25 test tiles at 100 grams at the four corners and then 20, 25 test tiles between them I'll dig up those posts and link those as well. Um, but they're just ways of using less uh, glaze until you know you want it. So don't mix up a many litre batch of a, a relatively untested glaze in case it doesn't work out. Don't mix up hundreds of gra grams for a test because you have no idea how it's going to work, etc, etc. You can just re reduce the amount you use, or reduce the amount you waste rather. Um, the amount you actually use on a fired piece doesn't matter that much. It's it's more the amount you're throwing away that would be a problem if anything was a problem. Um, reusing, obviously, as I said, you know if you have a bucket of water that you wash all your tools in, the glaze ingredients will settle to the bottom of it. <coughs> you can turn that. I mean, that will already be a perfectly viable glaze, so long as you're happy with the glazes that you're using beforehand, when you average them all together, they're not likely to make a glaze that's too far from a, a sensible glaze in the first place. Because most glaze chemistry ends up in broadly speaking the same place. Most of the ingredients are relatively interchangeable, um, if not exactly the same. So even if you have different fluxes in your each of your different glazes, um, when you add them all together, they'll all be doing the same thing, so it will work. Um, but it just might not give you a colour that looks like the average of the colours that went in. Um, so what you probably want to do, what I tend to do, is um, turn it into a black glaze, or a dark brown glaze at least, by adding iron oxide, because iron is incredibly cheap is easy to get hold of, works in an interesting way in that um, if you add 10% iron to something 
most glazes will then start to behave somewhat like an oil spot which makes them um, interesting and you know cheaply and then you can use it in combination with the other glazes that you have so it doesn't have to be the best glaze ever on its own because when you then add another glaze over the top and the oil the dark oil spot glaze starts bubbling through it then you get something interesting and it's basically for free if it's stuff that you would have thrown away and getting rid of glaze safely is actually one of the bigger challenges we face because a lot of the ingredients are bad for the environment so something like um, zinc comes with a warning that it shouldn't be let anywhere near aquatic life because it's harmful and what that means is that if you just chucked it out such that it could go down a drain could end up in a lake you know some fishes somewhere are not going to thank you for that so what you do well it's um, not entirely clear a lot of the time most um, ingredient suppliers don't tell you how to safely dispose of it um, I know it can vary from country to country one good way of getting rid of it in a pinch is to bisque fire it or even better well not even better but or glaze fire it but basically you take um, glaze ingredients that can flow as a liquid even if they're in suspension um, by bisque firing or glaze firing you turn them into a solid at which point <coughs> and this is actually what um, some well I got this from I think it was a ceramic materials workshop and seeker talk but um, there are schools where they would have to have very extensive um, checks and kind of testing of their water if they were to do anything that allowed them to go down the drain but if you fire them into a solid so just pour them all into a bowl and then once you've got a whole bowl full of glaze and it's completely dry you just fire that in the kiln that can be thrown off thrown away in just your normal rubbish it's it doesn't have to be disposed of like a, a toxic liquid um, another thing you can do better thing is re-gifting so if you know someone else who could use a glaze and all i do with mine is i tell uh, my in, put it on my instagram stories and just say to my followers does anyone want it <coughs> generally speaking there's a school or a club or or just a beginner some there are people who don't necessarily care how good the glaze is if it's one that I didn't like the appearance of and I'm not going to use and I've got a mixed up a, a small test it, it helps that my uh, all my ingredients come in little pots that can then be used to send these out it would be a bit more difficult I'm not sure what you'd do if you didn't have that maybe food containers but the point is I can decant all of my tests that didn't work out but are viable glazes um, into little pots and then I can just say who wants them and within the UK it's quite it's relatively inexpensive to ship a 20 kilo box so you can get quite a lot of glaze into a box someone can have that for the price of shipping and then none of those ingredients are wasted because when you're giving them to people who are just like if it's a, a hobby group or a, a class of uh, kids at school and they're not too fussed what the actual glaze is they just want to muck around and layer things in interesting ways and trying to get dra dramatic results um, you can get rid of glazes that you don't actually like the appearance of someone else will use them and enjoy them and those ingredients have not been wasted um, so that is well worth it then the next one I had I think was energy and pretty much the only thing of any significance that we do um, is firing the kiln and so really what you're looking to do in order to reduce uh, energy wastage there is fire sensibly pack the kiln fully with work that is going to be viable at the end of it um, there are uh, bigger industrial setups where the 
waste energy from a kiln is then used to heat office blocks or houses or something like that. It would be nice if there was a an easy way that we could apply that to our waste energy. I mean, obviously you can have it heat your studio in winter, but um, it would be good if you could store it longer term. And I don't know how would be best to do that. In theory, I think you could use like a an underground heat pumpy sort of thing. I don't know if you could then take the energy from the kiln at a higher level, put that back underground and then bring it back up when you wanted it. Um, I don't know how well that would work. Probably not worth even considering um, anything like that for most of us. You'd have to be using a lot of energy to warrant installing something. Oh, yeah, of course, the other thing is reducing your carbon footprint from energy would be to use solar power. Now a lot of people talk about getting solar panels on their roofs and I would say if you're in a country where there is a viable source of green energy that you can just purchase <coughs> that's probably better unless um, space is at a premium and um, that sort of energy isn't easy to come by because certainly in the UK not all of our roofs have been um, positioned optimally for solar panels and we have quite a few solar farms set up so if that solar panel is going to be anywhere it makes more sense for it to be in a solar farm than on a roof where it's working inefficiently but if you want to set up a solar panel and a battery you can offset all of the energy usage when you're not firing the kiln and some of the energy usage when you do fire it. I did work out the numbers at one point and the battery required to do a whole firing on even my little kiln <coughs> was pretty ridiculous because it needs in such a short time period. So um, normally when you get a solar panel and a house battery, they're thinking that you're gonna use a certain number of kilowatt hours over the course of a day and at no point are you going to use as many as we need in a two hour window but when you get to the peak of the firing that's when your kiln's basically on full power which means you're drawing a decent amount of power solidly and in order to have a battery that has enough kilowatt hours stored to deal with that you have to have something that's completely over the top for everything else and um, ended up being the equivalent of the sort of setup they'd fit in a, a moderate sized office building when I looked just because in order to completely do the kiln um, it, it ends up being a lot of energy however if you had a normal household battery one you'd do a third of a firing say or whatever it worked out as uh, and that's certainly better than nothing but if you can get just green energy that you purchase then someone else takes care of that it's a managed solar farm they keep the panels clean they keep everything working properly um, you don't need to think about it uh, the only thing is obviously as that scales up how they manage to do everything and yeah it's a problem for someone else but it is a problem um, next materials um, all I really said there was um, to consider material sources. If you've got somewhere local to you, that probably is better. But um, it actually, I looked into this before when I was trying to do the carbon footprint of a mug calculation. Um, and it's amazing how little difference shipping something across the planet makes if you're sending it by boat because they use a lot of energy, but they ship so much stuff on a container ship. The energy, the, the CO2 and the even the other emissions, which they are pretty bad on those big ships, the older ones. Um, once you divide it by the number of containers on one, it actually ends up not being too bad. So um, we have a lot of ingredients, clays, 
um, and the like that are mined here in the UK which is great I can buy clays and ingredients that um, have come from just down the road really I mean nothing quite in this county but in this end of the country there's um, plenty of mines producing stuff um, but it would probably make more difference if I kept ordering like a bag of clay at a time and having someone drive out from even a distribution hub to drop it off to me that would probably amount to a bigger shift in CO2 than ordering a bulk lot of stuff to the supplier um, from the other side of the world so material source is important but minimizing the deliveries to you is also important because it gets so much less efficient when it's a van potentially driving you know tens of miles just for you versus dividing a lot more emissions but dividing it out amongst many other people so ordering less frequently is a very easy way to reduce that number and some degree of material consideration um, and also um, from a kind of harm done to the people sort of point of view uh, it's worth considering there are some ingredients like cobalt and lithium where the quality of material source varies a lot so there's cobalt that's um, produced with child labor and then there's cobalt that is certified not produced with child labor um, you don't get the same sort of thing with silica and um, anything like that so you don't need to think about them as much but there are some ingredients where where you get it from will have a big impact on the people around where it's coming from uh, not so much on the planet although the lithium tailings tend to be pretty bad but it's not quite so global but um, those are something to consider if you can find out any information from your supplier a lot of them don't give it um, so you might have to dig for that if you can be bothered um, packaging I talk about a bit I have an opinion on this which isn't entirely popular which is that a lot of people are very anti single-use plastic and I don't like single-use plastic but I also know that it's sometimes in opposition to <coughs> other things which you have to decide whether or not they're worse so the classic example that people always complain about or seem to always complain about is um, the fact that cucumbers come wrapped in plastic like it should be obvious that they're not except that that extends the shelf life something like four to five times so by wrapping cucumbers in single-use plastic the um, supermarkets have used more plastic but they've reduced food waste now is the amount of co2 required to grow that cucumber drive it to a supermarket put it on a shelf keep the supermarket running pay all the staff etc 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 and then have it be thrown away because no one bought it in the first two days versus in the first six days you know <clears throat> which one's worse the bit of plastic or the co2 wastage and the same i feel applies for shipping pots now we've put a lot of material and um, I actually needed one straight sided one I haven't done a great job of getting the height from this so I might just leave this as the straight sided one that was easy um, distracted with the point I was making there yeah so we use a lot of energy to get to the point of shipping a pot now if you have a packing setup that you find works well for you um, that doesn't use any single-use plastic then that's great I have something that is nearly as good as bubble wrap and that's the um, I can't remember what it's called now ran pack but the two the concertina um, uh, kind of cardboard and tissue paper combination that I find works well enough for one mug 
or one bowl or one thing and then there's um, what's called cardboard bubble wrap which is not very much like cardboard bubble wrap but I use that for my tools because that's also good enough for them but the problem is when it comes to packing multiple pots in a single box I don't find that they work as well you either don't get much padding or you end up having to send it in a bigger box and it weighs more because the paper's heavier than the bubble wrap to start with and you have to use more of it to get enough padding to stop things from breaking so the main goal is to stop things from breaking because remaking them is the worst of all worlds you've wasted all of that energy and all of the shipping and it hasn't arrived intact so you then have to do it all again that's the worst possible outcome the next thing that I don't particularly like is the, the fact that if you're shipping something especially if it's going by air um, so something like FedEx Priority International and I think Royal Mail do as well they just don't do it quite as quickly but that's all flown that gets put on a plane and it gets flown across so having a bigger box having a heavier box reduces the number of boxes that can go on a flight not necessarily by a huge amount but if your box is 20% bigger that doesn't look like a big increase when you're looking at the box but scale that up to all the boxes you get less on the flight more flights more co2 um, again has it been worth it to save the plastic probably but if the plastic is recyclable technically and if it is recycled or if it's reused or whatever I'm not sure on that one I don't have a I don't necessarily think that paper packaging is um, is as required as it kind of seems it doesn't it seems like by using bubble wrap you're you're being really bad for the planet and I'm not so convinced about that but I do think the main thing is you have to be you have to consider whatever you're doing with it um, so whatever your justification for using whatever you're using is at least look into the different options test them and find what works best for you <coughs> and if there are situations where that is using bubble wrap um, reuse bubble wrap that you get uh, buy bubble wrap that already uses recycled uh, plastic and buy ones that are technically recyclable although I know um, there are issues with plastic recycling and I would have thought bubble wrap's one of the ones where technically recyclable doesn't equate to recycled in the majority of cases but you know that's you're trading something for something and you've got to pick your poison with that one I think um, then I think that was it for discussions. I had a slide that I cut from the Instagram post about carbon offsetting, uh, basically saying that carbon offsetting I think is good if you can find someone who's doing it properly and if you're going with someone cheap they're probably not doing it properly. So there's a, there's a lot of wooliness in carbon offsetting. Um, a lot of it is people revising projects. They say they were going to build something inefficient then they receive funding to build something more efficient and there's no kind of counterfactual there you don't know what they would have actually built if that situation wasn't there so a lot of the time the carbon that's technically being considered offset is probably carbon that never would have existed because it's there because if you put a high number on your starting column and a low number on your finish column you get a lot more money for it um, it's not a good incentive some of the other ones trees get planted but they don't get maintained or trees get planted but then there's a contract where they get harvested and not replanted later um, and so on and so forth so <coughs> cheap carbon offsetting carbon offsetting with no oversight or with poor planning is no better and sometimes worse than doing nothing I use um, so I use a charity uh, carbon offsetting 
called uh, COTAP, which is Carbon Offsetting Through the Alleviation of Poverty, um, C-O-T-A-P. Uh, smallish company, they have very good transparency, very good uh, rates of the amount of money that actually goes into their projects. And then what they do is they give the money to developing countries in order to plant uh, trees that can then be used like fruit trees to feed or provide an income for the local populations. So trees are planted but it's not a beautiful woodland in Scotland, it's actually a useful tree planted somewhere where it will be appreciated and worst case if there's no carbon offsetting it's a good use of your money for the the poverty alleviation. That's my logic, that's why I went with them. Um, a bit more pricey per kilogram of CO2 but still tiny in comparison to other costs. <clears throat> I was thinking about it the other day and I think I'm right in saying that to offset all the CO2 that I think I'm responsible for with everything that I do here including hopefully sourcing the materials so all the, the CO2 responsible for getting this clay to me me shaping it, firing it, and then um, boxing it, not shipping it, but everything up to that point, works out at a tenth of a percent of my annual turnover. So I, I in theory, have carbon offset everything as best as I can tell, and it really hasn't cost me that much. Um, and also has alleviated some poverty. So. If you're in a position to do that, then I kind of think that's um, a good use of money. So here we go, reclaiming clay. I'm going to put the um, the silty residue at the bottom of this into my faster reclaim bucket. And then all of the liquid mess goes into my settling out bucket, which I've got over by the sink. Um, and so what I will do is uh, take the water off the top and then chuck this water in and then the water off the top can go back in this bucket afterwards. So I just have a separate bucket for that. Um, and then uh, the last slide I have is just what aboutism, and because I know people always say what about and then you can insert companies or countries or you know whatever. So there are obviously plenty of people who are not doing things which are great for the environment and the impact they have is far greater than any one of us making pottery <coughs> regardless of what we do or don't do um, you know you could have the least inefficient studio I'm sorry least efficient or most inefficient studio possible you could waste as much as you wanted to and you would never be in the order of magnitude of some of the people who are uh, consuming and wasting and doing things that are bad for the environment. Um, there is obviously larger sy system, systematic, systemic changes need to happen. You know, uh, unfortunately, America rolled back some of um, some more of what they were doing. So it's been a bit of a, a rocky ride for uh, America's. Um, participation in this but I think well who knows anyway the point being that um, you can part of this is going to be political you do need to get people in charge who understand that climate change is um, more than just a talking point it is something that does need to be addressed because you know record heat waves and um, just generally things getting worse if we don't uh, move fairly quickly that's just going to keep going for a very long time um, but you can do all of this and you can also vote for people who want to change and then uh, complain at them when they don't and that will also have an impact um, more or less so in different countries and if you're in a country where you're unlikely to have any impact then um, I'm Sorry about that. I mean, there certainly are some countries where it's an easy sell and some countries where it isn't. Um, and I, you, know, you can only do what you can do. But 
a lot of these changes that I've been talking about are actually pretty tiny in the grand scheme of things. Um, like having a bucket of water to reclaim the clay and just remembering to wash everything in that first and same with glaze is a very, very easy step and um, doesn't actually cost me much time at all. Uh, gives me some clay back and then reduces my water use. So a lot of these you can, they take a, a small amount of effort to implement and then don't really cost you anything going forwards. And if you're <coughs> in any part of the world, like say California, having this system set up and knowing what you're doing is great for when the water does actually become difficult to get hold of. Um, you know that actually you, you've got an almost self-sustaining loop. You don't need much input at all. Um, so yeah, very waffly. Hopefully that all made sense. Um, I could go into a bit more detail here than um, I could in the infographics, but obviously uh, they are far more to the point. So if you made it this far, it's already too late to just go back in time and read them instead. So thank you for watching. Um, and let me know, um, well, <laughs> within reason, let me know what you think of all this.